Hello everybody and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we formerly coded a complete game live on stream and hopefully will continue to code a complete game live on stream. But I am on RSI break right now, so while the hands are healing, uh, we're just still hanging out because, well, there wasn't really a good reason not to still stream, just not to type. And I don't have to type uh, to stream, so there you go. Uh, we've been basically taking questions uh, where I can sort of see if there's people who have stuff that they would like me to cover. Uh, while we're on break and I got a question from somebody uh, in email that uh, actually sort of there was a number of things in it that I thought were kind of important to nail down and so I'd like to go over that now uh, I'd probably take a, a good portion of the program here and some of it is going to be review for people who followed all of Handmade Hero but it was it was something that was uh, it's, it's worth understanding enough that I just feel like it's worth doing another whiteboard on just so people are, are really comfortable with it and there's no question about this, the, the circumstance here. Um, so I want to talk about the difference between a conceptual resource uh, versus a physical resource. Uh, because what was apparent to me when I read the email uh, question, it was that the person who was asking it didn't seem to really understand the difference between a conceptual resource and a physical resource. And I can understand why that's true, because uh, in a lot of systems where you aren't programming from scratch, so, you know, on Handmade Hero, obviously it's an educational screen, so we program everything from scratch. And so we wrote the thing that actually loads everything off of the disk, and we, you know, we did all of that ourselves. And if that's your first introduction, as it was for me, for example, because when I was growing up and writing these things, there were no such thing as a game engine that didn't, that I don't even know if that word existed until I was, gosh, uh, probably 15, 16 or something, right? So uh, there really was no such thing as a uh, off-the-shelf thing that you got and built a game. You know, it wasn't like you went and grabbed Unity or something like this and started making a game without any idea of like what it was doing. That wasn't a thing. Uh, but if that was your first introduction to something like this, like the first time that you sort of started thinking about game development was with Unity or Game Maker or one of these things, it's kind of easy to, un to uh, understand why people could get confused between the difference be uh, or, or be confused or conflate conceptual and physical resources because sometimes they are es essentially the same in these tools, right? Meaning the, to the, the engine that you use may not differentiate between those two things in any way that you can perceive as an end user. Now, under the hood, they almost certainly are differentiating between them in their own code. But in your world, like what you see in terms of what the, the game engine exposes to you as a user, they may never uh, show that difference. And so I wanted to kind of underscore what it was and I'll answer the specific question the person had in the email as part of that, but this I thought was kind of a bigger issue that I wanted to make sure we touched on. So first of all, let me explain what a conceptual resource is. A conceptual resource is something you think of and talk about as a asset or something you use as part of the game, right? So a conceptual resource might be something like a mesh let's say, right? Like a 3D mesh uh, that you're going to use that you made in Maya or something like that, right? The conceptual resource. Another one, so for Handmade Hero, one example would be a bitmap, right? Uh, so some like image that you, you know, that you made, right? These are conceptual resources. And what I mean by that is that there isn't anything specific about them that makes them physical resources. There's nothing that makes them uh, have to exist in any particular way because they're just bits and bytes at the end of the day, right? But conceptually, we are thinking of this specific bundle of bits, right, as meaning this thing. So we're thinking of this 3D mesh as being a conceptually unit, like unified whole, right, that we talk about, we even give it a name, right, like maybe this thing has some, fi even a file name if it's in a file, or maybe if it's just a mesh that's in a Maya file, it's got just a name, so you know it's like, it's like hero underscore mesh or something, um, or whatever, so we even have a name for it, like humans like to name concepts, we may even have names for them, right, 
That's a conceptual resource. And the reason that I think it's important to understand what that means is because a conceptual resource has literally no relationship to a physical resource, okay? So what's a physical resource? A physical resource is something that you actually have to get, store, load, something that's actually binary data coming from somewhere in some kind of a package, okay? So a physical resource might be literally a file on a drive, let's say, or a file that's on a network somewhere, some, some uh, like a, a URL addressable thing, right? But it's something that is only considered a unit as far as the underlying system is concerned. So for example, we may have something uh, like, you know, handmade assets uh, dot, you know, uh, text or something like this, which is a text file that has a bunch of stuff in it or whatever. And this is a physical asset in the sense that it is like on the drive as a file. Right? It actually exists as a literal uh, resource, right? Uh, and the reason that I want to draw this distinction here is because this text file might have lots of conceptual resources in it. For example, the text file might have different sections and each section might be conceptually different, okay? More to the point, and the thing that I wanted to address uh, sort of as specific to the question that the person was asking, is we may have something called handmade, you know, dot uh, art or something, or better yet, let me just actually use, I forget what the file uh, thing is that we actually um, uh, called our stuff, uh, but in our data directory, uh, HHA, right? So there's a test1.hha or whatever, so we've got handmade.hha, okay? And what is handmade.hha? Well, it's a physical, physical resource, right? It's a file on the drive, but it is not a conceptual resource because what's in it is lots of concept. It's a bundle, right, of lots of conceptual resources. There's tons and tons and tons of bitmaps in there, tons of sounds in there, whatever, right? Okay, so this is a very, very important concept to understand. Uh, and like I said, for some people whose introduction to programming was through a more from scratch route, this is a trivial distinction. You never, you've always understood it and it's just second nature, right? But for someone who's coming at it the other direction, it'd be very easy to not understand the distinction between these two things, right? Okay. So with that in mind, I want to talk about the specific uh, question that the person asked. And that question was, Maybe I'll leave this kind of right there. Uh, that question was, why would a game ever need more than one file? Right? Why would it ever need more than one file? And this was talking uh, yesterday, because remember yesterday I kind of talked about, oh, I've got a game and it's got art files, uh, but I could package those all up into one file, right? And so uh, that by itself is an interesting question. Why would a game... Uh, ever need more than one file. So say like, why more, oops, why more than one file? Uh, and then the second question that the person asked, and it, I, I'm saying question, but really it was part of the question number one, they asked, there's sort of a separate thing that led to a different question that I wanted to address. Uh, and that is, why would every more than file? And they said, the only thing I can think of, they were saying is, that if you wanted to sort of have sprite sheets, right? Uh, and we've talked about sprite sheets before, that's basically like a single bitmap that has a bunch of, of different uh, frames of animation for a sprite packed into it. If you want to have different sprite sheets that you swapped in and out, right? For a character, let's say, then you might want to do that uh, by having the, the sprite sheet for one character and the sprite sheet for another character match up exactly, so you could just pick which one you were using uh, by changing which file you were using, right? Uh, so that's that's the next question, uh, which is like uh, sprite sheet, sprite sheets and swapping is a thing, right? Uh, and then three, uh, he sort of said, are there API limits or like, uh, you know, file size limits, right? That affect this decision. So I'm going to try and take all of these questions because they're all kind of lumped into one, right? 
so the first question, why more than one file, right? And so conceptually speaking, even if you had no limitations, so assuming two and three have nothing to do with this, and we're just talking about the game could do it any way it wanted, is there any reason just to have more than one file, right? Separate from everything else, is there any reason why the game just wants to have more than one file for its own uh, sake? Separate from the sprite sheet questions, separate from the API size file size limits, is there any reason, right? So is there a reason to have more than one file? And the answer there uh, is potentially yes. Uh, and the reason there is because of expansion, uh, uh, patching, etc. right? Conceptually speaking, you may want to write a game uh, and I you know what I should put in here too? Modding. Conceptually speaking, you may want your game to break things up into more than one file because those files are actually things uh, that a user may want to address in some way, right? Meaning a user may want to do something like mod a particular thing and distribute that mod. Uh, and that may be easiest to do by allowing there to be multiple files in the directory. So I want this file from this guy and this file from this guy, and I want to put them together, and I don't want to have to write an interface in the game, right, for pulling those files in and rewriting them out to like a single file because the game only supports one file or something like that, right? So iterating over a number of files and then merging their uh, results or picking and choosing which ones you use is a way of providing an interface to the user for editing the game. And furthermore, it provides a convenient interface for something like expansion where you could ship an installer where the installer is just a thing that copies a new HHA file, let's say, with, the, with all the new data in it into the directory. If the game is smart enough to read all the HHA files that are in that directory, then your expansion pack shipment is literally just, just that one file. It just drops in and off you go, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, potentially with patching as well, like I said, it might be easier on certain architectures because remember, you don't always have complete control about how patching works. Uh, depending on the platform holder and how they demand that patching works, uh, you may find that having more files makes it easier for you to work around limitations in their patching system, right? So there's plenty of reasons why you might conceptually want to do this for your own games ease of maintenance that don't really have that much to do uh, with the actual act of loading files or storing them to the drive um, or any other concerns like the sprite sheet question. So hopefully that sort of answers that question. Let's just move on to number two. So the sprite sheet and swapping question. So this is why I wanted to sort of underscore the difference between conceptual and physical resources is I don't really understand that question because having sprite sheets that you swap is no harder to do inside a pack file than outside of it, right? So. If I have a.bitmap and b.bitmap, right, and I want to pick which one of these I use in a game for the hero, that's no different than if I have uh, my HHA file and I've got two, I've got a.bitmap packed in there and b.bitmap packed in there. I still, when the game is running, it still chooses which one of these it's going to load out of the HHA file into memory, right? So the HHA file or any packed file it doesn't give you any less versatility at runtime, right, than having them as separate files. Because at the end of the day, a physical resource has nothing to do with a conceptual resource. A single physical resource can still be loaded at, um, in parts, right, as separate conceptual resources. So a conceptual resource does not have to map one-to-one -to, -one to your physical resources. They're completely different, and you don't really have to worry about that at all. So the only time, again, where you care about your conceptual resource to physical resource mapping is when you have some sort of expansion patching modding idea and you feel like it might be easier for you if they were separated in this way because then users don't have to copy, like say, extra data that they don't actually need to copy around when distributing a mod or something, right? Because they're doing that through their own uh, back channel that doesn't involve your game and so your game can't help them extract uh, and redistribute the conceptual resources, right? Now that said, even that, not that big of a deal, uh, because for example, like if you look at the Doom community, uh, that used .wad files uh, back, the old Doom Wolfenstein, um, you know, successor Doom by id Software. 
uh, the original Doom, it used a, a pack file format called .wad, and in that file it just had uh, all the resources for the game, and basically like the modding community just wrote tools to like extract and recombine them anyway. So at the end of the day, like even even at some level, you might not really care because people can overcome those limitations pretty easily as long as you document your pack file format and make it easy for people to work with. Um, it's really not a big deal, right? So anyway, there's that. So now let's actually talk about number three, which is are there API and file size limits? And the answer actually is yes. Uh, so what happens, uh, unfortunately, is that certain file systems uh, impose a maximum file size limit on the any single contiguous file in that uh, in that file system. So, for example, uh, if you have uh, say uh, a FAT32, um, I believe the FAT32 file system uh, limits any particular file to like uh, I either two or four gigabytes. I think it's two. I think it's basically assigned integers worth of uh, assigned 32-bit integers worth of space. So I think FAT32 is two gigabytes, for example. So, you know, if you were gonna distribute, let's say the witness, right? Um, if you're distributing the witness, then you have a thing that's bigger than two gigabytes. And so it can't fit in a single pack file if that pack file has to go on a FAT32 drive. Now, maybe you don't care about supporting a FAT32 drive, and that's fine, but the point is, yes, there are actual file size limits depending on the file system that's chosen for the storage medium that the game is going to run off of, right? So there's that. Another limitation is download, right? If people have to download these files uh, or do other things with them, uh, then you might want to think about the fact that like, well, okay, you know, if, if I'm distributing these, maybe I want to try to distribute them in ways where the files themselves could be useful or could be complete or checked in smaller increments uh, so that you know if you've got it all. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so because typically network distrib, you're kind of not in the loop there. So I feel like that's probably not really that relevant. Um, but I don't know, there could be reasons for transfer on network where you would care about making things not be so huge. But I feel like most people are going through a service like Steam or, um, you know, or uh, uh, something like GOG with a downloader uh, these days. So I don't know. I mean, it's probably just not that big a deal. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, there are some limitations. Are there API limitations? Well, yes and no. So. In general, most modern operating systems allow 64-bit uh, control over your files. Uh, so, you know, if there's a file that's bigger than 2 gigabytes or 4 gigabytes, it's not a problem for the operating system. It's only the problem if the file system underlying it is, you know, the wrong size. That said, there is an interesting caveat, which is, um, for example, there's a thing called a memory mapped file. Uh, and we played with these a little at Handmade Hero when we were playing around with the recording stuff. And a memory map file is when you basically tell the operating system, look, uh, I've got a memory range, you know, and I want to map that memory range to something on the disk. So here's a file, right? So whenever I read from or write to this address in memory, I want you to read or write that same thing uh, to, to or from the file. Uh, and this is a kind of, uh, depending on the circumstance, it's, I don't like this, let's put it this way. I don't think memory map files are a good idea pretty much ever, um, but they do have some nice uh, properties. Uh, one of them is they behave better with the virtual memory system in an oversubscription scenario and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't like memory map files. I, I think they're a bad idea. That said, um, memory map files, uh, are, are basically a way of assigning a range of memory to a range of bytes on the drive, right? And if you only have a 32-bit address space for your memory, it means you can only have a 32-bit sized file, right? So for example, uh, if I was on x86, remember, because there's two types of processors, there's x64 and x86. Uh, two types of processor architectures at play on PC. There's the old style, which is x86. It can only address uh, memory in a 32-bit fashion, uh, barring some large address extensions, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but for the most part, 
you're practically talking about 32-bit address space. X64 can uh, uh, access 64-bit address space, all right? So what that means is that older computers which are running x86, they don't have 64 bits of addressable memory space. And again, this has nothing to do with how much memory is actually in the system. I'm just talking about the range of addresses that they can talk about, right? Because, you know, remember, there's the concept of a pointer. We use them all the time on Handmade Hero. They point to a particular place in memory, right? If that pointer is 32 bits, which it is on x86, then it can only look at 32 bits worth of address space. Doesn't matter, there could be 16 gigabytes of memory in the system. It, any given application only has the ability in its virtual address space to talk about 32 bits, which is four gigabytes. That's it, right? So, what that means is no matter how much memory you pile into the machine or how much virtual ad, uh, memory uh, you've set up your system to use, on x86, you can only have 32 bits worth of address space, which means that any file larger than four gigabytes can't even be mapped into memory if you used all the memory of the machine, uh, sorry, not all the memory, all the address space of the machine, you couldn't even map it into memory. You, you couldn't even do it, right? Which puts a hard limit of four gigabytes on any file you might push through this API. But the actual practical situation is even worse than that because obviously you can't use 100% of the memory uh, range of your application because if you did, there'd be no room for anything else. So mapping a four gigabyte file would literally take up the entire address space that your memory could, that your uh, application could talk about, right? Every, every single pointer would now point into the file. You could not point into any of your own uh, memory at all. You could never even allocate a block of memory because there'd be no way to tell you where it was because every possible pointer, all possible pointers in 32 bits are all pointing to somewhere in the file. So in reality, obviously it's less than four gigabytes. It's four gigabytes minus however much memory you need, right? So it's, 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 it's minus the memory you need, that's how big the file is. But it's worse than that. Because not only does all the memory you need have to be accounted for, all the memory the operating system might need to use on your behalf also has to be taken out. And that's not even really all that negotiable. Because the way that Windows works is at startup, for the most part, uh, it partitions the memory space in half and says the top two gigabytes will be used for the system, the bottom two gigabytes will be used for the application of the four gigabyte address space that's 32, that for 32 bit x86, uh, okay? And so what that means is you start off with only two gigabytes to begin with because the other two gigabytes are used for all sorts of operating system mapping. Now again, I want to underscore that this is the application's virtual memory space. Remember, you talked a lot about this in the early days, but in case you forgot, virtual memory is what your program talks about the memory as being, right? When you say, I want address whatever, some random pointer, when you hold up that pointer and say, I want this address, that's what you mean. Now remember, it goes through a remapping table that the operating system sets up in the CPU it goes through a remapping table to get to physical memory. So we're not talking about physical memory. And again, you can have more physical memory. An x86 machine could have more physical memory in it, in theory. Uh, I don't know if, if that sort of thing ever actually got built. I don't think it does. But, you know, in theory, there could be a lot more physical memory in the machine. And you could, like, maybe map each bank to a different processor and use some kind of segment. So, I, mean, I don't know if the x86 architecture even allowed that. I don't remember because it was never a practical issue that I ever addressed. So I don't know. But point being, we're not even talking about physical memory. We're just talking about the address space, right? We're just talking about the address space that your program uses to articulate what it wants to do, okay? And that address space is partitioned into two gigs, two gigs. And so what happens in that upper two gigs here? Well, this is where like hardware stuff gets mapped in. Like for example, there's ranges of this that are used for mapping like how we talk to the GPU. So it backs memory that's like across the PCI bus sometimes. It has all the stuff like file handles that you have open. It has the code for the kernel that you can call into, like all the APIs you can call into, all the DLLs that are mapped, they all go in there, right? So everything uh, is, is even worse than this picture might might make it out to be. You actually only have two gigabytes. Now, there was a way on, uh, um, on Windows, if the user wanted to, the user could run Windows in what was called uh, 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 3GB mode, 
I think. Uh, it was called 3GB mode. Uh, so called because if you started the kernel with the kernel parameter slash 3GB, which you could do by, by changing the way Windows boot loaded worked. It, it's a long story, it doesn't even matter. But point being, uh, a user could boot their machine in a way that actually had, oh dear, what did I do? What have I done? I've zoomed us, there we go. A user could boot their machine in a way that did not look like this, uh, that would actually make it look like this, where there'd be three gigabytes and one gigabyte. Uh, so the system took less space and the user's uh, application, each application could talk about three gigabytes instead of two gigabytes, right? So that was pretty handy. That's like a real nice thing, right? Uh, and so uh, you could do that, but the user had to do that. So you can't ship an application that relies on that because most users wouldn't even know how to add the 3GB uh, switch to the kernel boot. So forget about that. So you have to assume you can only run in that two gigabytes. So again, that puts the practical limitations on how big of a file you could map very small. Think, you know, significantly less than two gigabytes, right? Uh, now let's say one more thing about that. So in addition to all of these other nastinesses, there's one more thing that makes the two gig thing a problem, is that even if you somehow took almost no memory, so you could use the whole two gigabytes of your memory for actually doing uh, that memory map file, it still might not work because if you don't take absolute care not to like accidentally allocate out of the middle of this or something, right? Then that memory map, that file memory map, it has to be contiguous. So the actual amount of file mapping you can do in a two gigabyte airspace depends on the largest contiguous free section. So for example, if this was right at the one gigabyte mark, then and where I like accidentally allocated some memory there to run the game or whatever, then it'd actually only be one gigabyte free here and one gigabyte free here, which would mean, well, and less, both of them be less because there's some memory taken on the middle, but approximately one gigabyte, right? At that point, I've just cut the size that I can map a file in half. Even if I've only taken like 4K to run my game, the size of the file I could map uh, is cut in half, right? In practice, it's going to be way worse than that. So, you know, again, uh, that's a very practical API limitation. Uh, you don't have to worry about it so much in 64-bit uh, because again, since we're not actually talking about physical memory here, we're talking about virtual memory, you can map a file that's much larger uh, in 64-bit windows because when the operating system uh, memory maps a file, it's strictly reserving the address range and saying anything in this address range, if someone tries to touch it, I'm going to go get the part of the file I need at that time. Right? It doesn't go try to load the whole file actually into memory and actually use physical memory for it. It will actually just leave it as sort of conceptually mapped, right? It'll put it in the mapping tables that it uses to keep track of where everything is, but it won't actually start pulling things into physical memory until it actually needs to. And it won't oversubscribe, so if you start pulling in other stuff, it'll page out part of the file. It'll just, you know, un get rid of that part uh, to make room in physical memory for some other part of the file. So at the end of the day, you can map very large files in 64-bit windows because you only have to make sure that you have enough vir contiguous virtual uh, memory re you know, space to map it. And with 64 bits of address space, that is huge swaths uh, you know, available, right? So you could probably, I mean, I don't know, I've never tried, but you could probably map a one terabyte file uh, and it'd be fine because there's gonna be a giant space somewhere in the 64-bit address space uh, that can support one terabyte. Remember, one terabyte's only you know, a few bits above 32, right? So it's really not that big a deal uh, for 64-bit. So. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. Uh, and let me take a look and see if we've uh, gotten any other cues uh, queued up here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, you know what? I didn't know if I set the scroll back. Did I set the scroll back? In to how do you kind of say I want to remember everything, like infinite scroll back? Here we go. Scroll back lines. Can I set scroll back lines to infinite? Can I just set it to zero or something and have it be infinite? Does that work? I don't even know if it does. Um, man. I'm not sure. Oh, sounds, alerts, 
general colors, color switcher, I don't even know. What am I looking at? I have no idea. I don't know. So I don't know if this thing's working or not. I have no idea. Uh, let's see. All right. Question, is there any way to reverse engineer a pack file and figure out how it's laid out like Resident Evil MD1 files in PSX? Uh, sure, yeah, there's lots of ways. And uh, I'm the wrong one to ask about like the ticks and tricks for that because I don't really do a lot of that. Uh, but yeah, if you want to reverse engineer a file, then uh, typically what ends up happening is... Um, typically what ends up happening is the... Uh, you start to try and piece through the binary data to look for things that you recognize, um, like things that might be the counts of something or things that look like a particular type of data, like zipped data, like something that's been zip compressed or something that looks like a texture in DXT format or who knows what, right? So you do stuff like that uh, and you can try to reverse engineer it. The harder core reverse engineering, I'm assuming and don't really know, but I'm assuming the harder core reverse engineering tends to be more... Um, that you, uh, that the uh, uh, the people disassemble and step through the actual code of the game and look at how it loads it in, because then you can see what sort of stuff it does, like how it decompresses it and how it jumps around. So I suspect that there's a fair bit of like looking at the game code as well in to, to do more advanced file formats. Uh, but yes, people absolutely do this all the time. I, d I don't, but... You know, it's it's certainly a straightforward process, but it's a bit tedious. Cuber Caleb, why do you think that memory map files are a bad idea? Uh, because you have very little control of how they are overlapped and when they're issued in terms of when they read from and evict parts of the file. And so I just don't feel like it's a good performance-oriented programming practice to memory map a file. The Giallo, does Stream allows to patch files instead of overwrite them? Oh, to Steam. Uh, so could one patch the one data file having an update that is not a practically full reinstall? Yes. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there are... So I believe Steam just works. Uh, there are other... Sometimes people make mistakes. Uh, platform vendors make mistakes and they do something stupid. And at the risk of being overly opaque here, I'll simply say that I know that people have made mistakes of the form. They encrypt the data that apps install because the platform has DRM or whatever. And they forgot about the fact that once you encrypt something, it becomes unpatchable because an encrypted thing, all the bitstream depends on everything that, that's downstream from it, right? Uh, so if you, if you have a platform that encrypts files opaquely to you, then you can't patch anymore and everything's a reinstall. So that has happened in the past uh, more than once, I believe. Uh, and so some platforms really s screw that up, but, uh, but I don't think Steam is one of them. Uh, I don't know this, uh, the game at Molly Rocket will be the first Steam release that, that, uh, I'll have been directly doing myself and so at that point I'll have maybe I haven't looked at it myself yet but that'll be the first time I really have to think about how steam what steam does and whether there's anything particularly important I need to know Elvin any ideas or thoughts about those anti-piracy ideas uh, I'll stop you right there and I'll just say I don't like anti-piracy full stop I think they're just plain bad um, I don't like game piracy, obviously. I don't like the fact that people, um, you know, uh, don't participate in the market properly and they basically like get, you know, uh, it, it's basically like someone who, it's, it's the people who go to the restaurant and don't tip, right? It's like you, you're forcing everyone else to subsidize your purchases, right? Because you won't pay for the game, so now everyone else has to pay more for the game, right? Because if everyone actually paid for the game who played it, uh, then games could be a lot cheaper. And even more importantly than that, some games that didn't sell enough copies right now to actually be um, viable or use, have the budgets that they had would. And those are very important things. So I, I, I really hate 
game piracy or just software piracy in general. But at the same time, I don't think that the right solution to that is anti-piracy uh, DRM. And the reason for that is because it creates some very serious problems. It means that users have a hard time maintaining their game collection, right? Uh, you know, you end up with a disc you can't even, you, you bought Grand Theft Auto on the Xbox and now you'll never be able to play that again. You have to go buy it again, right? And now you're actually, you're being taken advantage of. You were trying to participate in a market fairly and pay uh, the developers for what they did. And now you're essentially being penalized because you know, you've been given a copy that you can't run anymore, right? Uh, and furthermore, the same is true for like people who find that their game doesn't run because the DRM doesn't work on their system or something like this, which happens all the time. Uh, it also creates a problem for preservation. It means that it's harder for a museum or archive.org or someone like this to maintain a running copy of this game for posterity. And all of those things I think are really bad. Uh, so I have no, nothing to say about anti-piracy ideas that people have other than they're stupid and don't do them. Long Boolean, I've been thinking about how to implement water reflections in a top-down 2D game. What do you think about using render layers like bottom to top water, reflection, land, shadows, object, things, then combining the layers? I mean, it seems fine, uh, but you know, it's hard to talk in abstractions about something as specific as how to render water reflections, you know? Captain Craft, do you have any idea what um, do you have any idea for hardware architecture design that could improve performance for games? Uh, not really, because I uh, I'm not really a hardware guy. So I mean, I you know I like I said I have API. I I feel like there's some things I can say about API design that are like this is good for performance. This is good for longevity in terms of the interface between the software and the hardware. But once you get into the hardware, uh, that I think is just, I don't have enough experience with hardware to have any opinions that are worth anything. Um, you know, I just don't know the realities of when you implement something on silicon. I, I just don't know everything that's involved there. I've only very cursory knowledge uh, of it. And so I feel like my opinions on how you would improve performance for games and hardware are, I mean, to some, to some extent, they're almost non-existent. I, don't know what the current performance problems are. You know, like, I mean, I don't know what actually is the biggest bottleneck, for example, in a modern hardware part. I sometimes maybe know that somebody at Intel or somebody at NVIDIA or somebody might have told me that they think something is this, and but that's just hearsay. I mean, I have no opinion, my own opinion about this was a bottleneck or whatever. You know, maybe that person's wrong or maybe, you know, they're misguided or maybe that's not the whole story. So, so I, I don't know. Um, so I, I pretty much only deal with software and the software to hardware interface I have some opinions on because I've seen enough of that and I have a fairly good idea of what that sort of ends up looking like uh, at the hardware substrate level. But I, below that, it's, I just have to trust that when a hardware vendor tells me something that they're not just making it up uh, because I, I don't know and can't verify. Uh, Snowvin92, under development and before the release of a PC game, are there good practices for making sure that a game will work on end user's machine and not get bugs caused by user's hardware? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. Um, so uh, I can say that at least one thing for us at Molly is since this is our first release on uh, our, our first game release that we're doing, and it's entirely custom, the engine is completely custom. Uh, we will almost certainly do early access, not for any other reason than we need the hardware testing. So, you know, our game may be completely done, uh, but we will almost certainly still release on early access uh, to get a certain amount of beta testing before we officially call it a release because uh, we're going to need that. Now, maybe we'll figure out a different way to do it. Maybe we'll figure out a way to test without that. Uh, but we'll need something like that. We'll need some way to release something that's a hardware test that people can run and report bugs to because we don't 
want to really be in a situation where our day one release has tons of hardware bugs because you know people's crazy hardware has weird things we have to work around or whatever right um so yeah i don't have a good solution to that problem the only thing i i think that uh an indie developer can really do is release something as a test whether that's a full early access build of your game or maybe that's like a little executable you post for free on your website that runs basically the game without the actual game, like the assets aren't there or whatever, but it kind of runs the, the basic stuff. And then has users like test it and say, yes, this worked for me or no, it didn't. So that you can start to build up that understanding of, of where the bugs are. So we're going to try to do something like that. And like I said, I don't feel like there's really any substitute for it at the moment, at least not for any developer. Maybe if you're a massive developer, you could just buy every machine that comes out every year and spend, you know, $100,000 a year just buying computers and have a giant testing lab and run them. But even that, I feel like, might not be enough because it's not always the hardware that's the bugs. It can also be the software. Like, oh, someone installed Adobe Acrobat and it's taking 25% of the CPU all the time and your game runs really poorly. You need to find that out. And you need to be able to post a thing that's like, hey, users, if your game is running slowly, see if Adobe Acrobat is running and kill it. Like, that's something you couldn't have known just by testing hardware, because the hardware may be fine, uh, but, the, but, you know, the, the 20,000 Bing toolbars and the whatever the user has installed in their machine might be the problem, and you, you have to find that out too, right? And that's not something that a hardware lab could really tell you. Uh, PragmaScript, do you have to go to the Steam Greenlight process in Steam for your game, do you think it's a good idea? Uh, we do not have to go through the Steam Greenlight process for our game. Um, we already got our game approved. Uh, but do I think it's a good idea? I don't know. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on Steam Greenlight. In fact, I guess I don't spend any time on Steam Greenlight, so I don't know very much about it. Um, it seems to me like Valve is pretty generous with approving games these days. So I feel like Steam Greenlight, they accept larger swaths than they used to. So I feel like if you have to go the Greenlight route to get your game approved, I suspect it's probably a lot easier now than it used to be just because they approve a whole lot more games. That said, I don't really know much about it. So I couldn't give you any specific advice. Gary Johansson, if you had an easy way to write whatever code you wanted on the GPU, would you write your own renderer and never use OpenGL again? Yes, I would. Uh, and that's what Larrabee was supposed to be, and I wish that project had succeeded, but it didn't, because um, I would really love to never have to use a graphics API again. The Jello, so all the huge updates I continuously have on Steam are dev faults, like 35 gigabytes over 35 gigabytes of clean install. Do you know what was the one gigabyte update of TW4? I was wondering why it was so huge so early. Um, so first of all, I'll say, like I said, I don't know if all the huge updates I can t you can have on Steam are developers' faults. They might be, but they might not be. Um, like I said, I, I just, I'll have more to say about that once I actually look at the actual Steam distribution stuff. Um, but I, I don't think they made any bugs as bad as the one that I described, where the whole thing always has to be updated. I think you can patch uh, things a little bit more grandly than that, but I don't know. Uh, so someday I'll, I'll have more to say about that when I actually have to go through it. As for the witness, uh, the one gigabyte update for the witness may actually have been legitimate uh, because I think they did a ton of video stuff that was actually like had to get added in. Um, so I think I think that may have been legitimate, I, but I don't know. You have to ask John. I'm not involved in that process at all. So it may it may have been sloppiness. It may have been legitimate. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I I don't even know. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Cuber Caleb, how do you feel about DRM schemes like Denuvo that take a considerable amount of CPU time during gameplay and add to hard disk writes, which is bad for SSDs? Like I said, I don't have any particular opinions about a given DRM scheme. I think they're all a bad idea. It's just, DRM is just a bad idea. I don't like it. I don't think we should use it. Elvin, I was just curious in my question, how some games know if the player is playing a legitimate versus cracked version where they crank the difficulty level and make it impossible for the cracked version to beat, they use some sort of DLL version signature or dot, dot, dot. Um, so uh, it depends a lot on the particular uh, scheme, right? Uh, but there's 
There's tons, and they date back, you know, as, as far back as, as some of the earliest home computer games, right? So uh, usually what happens is they do something which is very hard uh, to detect when you disassemble the game and takes a long time to find, but that what is uh, substantively something that you can still uh, reverse engineer around and patch, because obviously anything running on a machine, someone can reverse engineer and then patch to remove the DRM. So all DRM is breakable in that sense, uh, because if you don't have hardware assistance, then there's nothing you can do, right? Uh, so usually a good example would be, let's say the game comes on a, uh, well, let's say the game uh, uses the net, for example. So you have to have an internet connection to play it. And what it might do is send out uh, requests to a server, uh, and those requests are something that, that uh, you know, it, it like a, a, a 1K of what appears to be random data, and the server sends back 1K of what appears to be random data, and the game checks that 1K of random data to see if it's correct, right? Because it has some idea of how those things should be matched. Uh, and then assuming that it is, it continues playing, right? Now, obviously you can imagine doing this in such a way that it would be impossible for any attacker to actually know what the 1K responses should be, right? Because let's say I took something like the 1K, it, I send it out uh, like, like a public private key encryption scheme, right? So let's say I take 1K of data on the client side, I encrypt it with the private, uh, sorry, with the public key for a server. I send it to the server, the server sends me back a version, right, encrypted with, uh, you know, a different uh, private uh, public key or something that I can decrypt with the private key or something like that, right? So the client side has two keys in it that it can use to encrypt and receive things from the server, but the two other corresponding keys, uh, well, I guess you'd only, you, you know, you really wouldn't need two keys now that I think about it. You would pretty much only need yeah, you really, to be honest, you only actually need uh, the one key. You just need the one coming back from the server. So I send one key of random data. The server encrypts it with its private key and sends it back. I take my public key for the server and I decrypt it and I see if it's what I expect. If it's not, I know the user has, uh, uh, is, is cheating or something, right? Doesn't have a legitimate account or whatever it is, right? Um, and so in those cases, right, if you start to hack it out, uh, then typically, like, if it's really trivial and I just do this one check, you know what, let me just draw this out. Because it's really generic. So the way this generally works, right, is you have something that's the check, right? You have a thing that's the check, and what the check does is something that's hard for the user to duplicate. So that one that I was talking about where, like, I send something out to a server and it comes back and it has to be the right answer or I don't keep going, right? That's one example. But another one, like in the old times when there was physical media, they used to do stuff like you'd have, you know, the, the disc uh, would have some region on it. Uh, and that region of the disc would have an intentional defect uh, that you could not reproduce when you burned your own disc. So it's like something that would not happen normally. It would have a defect on it that when you read it, it would read in two, it could read in either way. So, you know, maybe it's a thing where it's like, uh, it, if you read it one time, you get 1101011 or something like this, right? But if you read it a second time, you get 10110110, right? Well, now you've created something where the game can see if, it, if you're reading off a legitimate DVD, right? By just reading that part of the DVD many times and making sure that it gets back more than one answer for the same sector of the DVD, right? You turn off OS caching, read the DVD multiple times, and you should get back different answers, right? So there's some kind of a check that's hard for the user to duplicate. This would be very hard for the user to duplicate, right? Because they'd have to make a DVD with an intentional defect that worked this way, right? So you have to do that, and then you've got a check. Now the check is something that in the game code you do, you call the check, right? You say, hey, check, this thing, it does whatever that test is and it comes back with a positive or negative answer, right? Yes, it's a valid version, no, it's not, okay? Uh, so then you can just say, well, if the check comes back, um, you know, true, do this thing. If the check comes back false, do this thing. And there's your, there's your DRM, right? Here's the case for the, the valid and here's your case for the invalid. You can do whatever you want. You can crash the game, you can make it harder, you can do whatever you want, right? 
Now, the problem with this is that this is a giant, like, bullseye for the Haxor who comes around and wants to crack your game, right? So the Cracker comes in, they know what you're going to try, so they look for things that read the DVD, whatever, they disassemble the code, they find it back, they track it back to this if statement and go, oh, all right, they've got this if on the check, so I'll just go ahead and do whatever I'm going to do, right? Uh, I'll, I'll just patch over this to be an if one instead, and it just works, right? So now you don't need it, the game is cracked, we're done. So really what happens now this is the way DRM used to work, like in the old days, like Commodore 64 days, right? This would have been a floppy disk here, uh, but basically the same thing, where you do the check, then you, you have your path for valid and your path for invalid or whatever, right? And invalid was usually just don't load. Well, this part here, uh, you want to make it much harder for the cracker to know where that is. So now what people do is the actual source code for the game is like littered with things that are interwoven with the checking. So instead of a giant bullseye that's just like one if that's like, is it legal or not, right? It's all throughout the code. There's like dependencies on that and checking in multiple places and, uh, you know, try to delay and repeat the checks in weird ways that it's very hard to disassemble and find, right? So basically you're sort of doing essentially a metacode process over the game where you're distributing the check and dependencies on the check all interwoven throughout the code so that it's very, very hard for the cracker to know that they've got them all. And that's also why they do stuff like, instead of just failing to load the game, they make it so that you have to play the game and see if it's actually completable because that makes it much harder for that cracker to know whether they've succeeded, right? So that's how that stuff works. Now what they do, the part that I don't know is these days, I don't know what they use for the check. Obviously, they don't use a DVD check anymore because oftentimes games don't come on DVDs. So that doesn't happen. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I think we're basically out of time. So anyone who has questions, you might want to... Uh, you might want to wait. Or remember them. If that makes sense. Let's see. Let me see if there's any other quick ones. So some of these, I think there are some good questions in here. So I would say, uh, folks, save these questions uh, for tomorrow, and uh, and we will take them. They're they're pretty good questions. So we'll take them on stream tomorrow, uh, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. A day so if you didn't get your question answered some of those were good questions uh, if you come back tomorrow uh, we will we will take a look at some of those because uh, yeah there's some good stuff in there all right thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of handmade hero it's been a pleasure coding with you as always if you uh, want to hang out with us again uh, we're on our SI break right now so no typing um, but if you would like to hang out with us for more uh, game dev chat you uh, can just go ahead and come back here tomorrow, 5.30, same time, uh, and we will be back here. If you get confused, just go to handmadehero.org, and you can push this little tweets button. And uh, also, this little nothing scheduled thing, if you refresh the page, uh, usually it'll say, like right now it says live now. If I refresh it when, if I refresh it sometime when I'm not on, it'll usually have a little countdown timer that'll say, you know, what it is. But there's also the tweet bot. Uh, and if you check out the tweet bot, you can see, um, besides Twitter's lovely advertisements, uh, you can see like there'll be a schedule and then little reminders. So you can always uh, subscribe to the Handmade Hero uh, tweet bot, and that will keep you up to date so that you never have to worry. So there's that. Hope to see you guys tomorrow. Uh, it's been good hanging out. As always, if you uh, are programming this evening, have a good programming, have some good programming tomorrow, and I'll see you on the stream uh, tomorrow at 530 PSD. Take it easy, everyone.